Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, a lot of people out there. Wow, thank you all for coming. This is amazing. And Dorothy's family thinks, wow, this is amazing. Right. My brothers and I, you know, I know many of you. My brothers have not met all of you. But we do welcome you and thank you for coming. And what we thought we'd like to do is, since you've all reminded us that one of the things you appreciated about Dorothy was that she was so upbeat and into everything and very enthusiastic about continuing on, being interested in everything, we would appreciate that you would share your thoughts and memories about Dorothy. And I'm sure we'll all be surprised to learn new things about our mother that we never thought about. <laughs> we only knew her in certain situations and you knew her well in others. But uh, as I thought about what I would say about my mother, I will tell you this. On her birth certificate, it says her middle name is Dean. However, those of us who would have known her well know that that's not really so. Her middle name was Efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that she used to tell about was that shortly after she married my father, Fred, they moved to Erie. And she was so proud that she was making a roast for dinner. Well, the roast got done. She took the roast out of the pan, put it on a plate in the oven, and immediately washed the pan. <laughs> then she proceeded to call her aunt and say, how do you make gravy? <laughs> and her aunt said, well, you take the pan that the meat was cooked in and. <laughs> When I was 10, <laughs> she went to work for the VA hospital here in Erie. And that first year, she decided that she would bake cookies as a thank you gift for all her volunteers. That was wonderful. I got to stay home for four days and help my mother make cookies. <laughs> I remember standing for four days to bake cookies. Well, the cookie tradition lasted. And she kept records year to year of how many kinds of cookies she made, how many times she doubled the recipe, and how many cookies she got out of that recipe. Now, for those of you who don't know, these were not cookies the size of my hand, which you often get places. These were cookies the size of a silver dollar. The point was they were exactly two bites of absolute perfection. And in keeping her records, she had, let's see, the top year was 25 different kinds of cookies for a total of 27,000. <laughs> mind you, she's working full time while she's doing all this. Plus and two. having brought this up, I'm sure there are those of you out there who have sudden visions dancing about Blitz torts and Sean torts and, 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 and I will tell you, I have known my mother also to go to the kitchen at 11 o'clock at night and start baking English muffins from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will turn the mic over to all of you. Somebody has to break the ice. <laughs> I have to tell you, my name is Jill Schaefer, and Dorothy and I became very good friends. We had known one another for about 20 years. We didn't meet at this reception or that reception, but we really didn't become friends until one night about 20 years ago. 
I was in a play up by 14th and State in a loft up there, and as Dorothy would do, if nobody would go with her, she would go alone. So she was at this play, and it was closing night, and the next day I had to drive to Columbus, Ohio, to my daughter's, where I now live. But um, not with her. <laughs> We're good friends, but we never live together. Uh, anyway, uh, what was that? A wise decision. That wise decision. <laughs> anyway, uh, the play was a comedy, and it, it was um, when it was over. Uh, a friend of ours, Harry Miller, who now owns La Bella, plugged for him at 18th and wherever. Anyway, uh, he at that time was co-owner of the coffee shop, the name of which I can't remember, but it was on 8th Street. And so Harry was at the theater and he said, well, why don't you two come over and have a nice coffee? And we said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. So we did go over. Uh, they went over first. I had to pack all my belongings. And I met them there. Well, needless to say, by the time I got there, they already had their iced coffee. And But we were sitting and chatting, and here he said, why don't we all go dancing? <laughs> and we looked at him, and we didn't even know there was a place at 12th in Pittsburgh where you could dance. And there were, was continuous music, and Dorothy's going, right? <laughs> and I, you know, had things I had to get done. And, but we went. And we danced every dance till three in the no. <laughs> And that's how we became friends. And it was one of the pleasures of my life. And uh, I just turned 85, and I'll tell you, I've learned that friendships are the joy of life. And the, the, the joy of life. And I treasure every moment that we have together. And we'll always miss her when we come here. Sure. Mm -hmm. Didn't like? Yeah. Just a little here. Podium. Is this okay? Yes, it is. But you seem so. The podium seems so tall. You want to hide? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the thing is, I I need notes because I might just ramble otherwise. So I would you like the mic, notes. Patty? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought I could yell. You know, I'm just a teacher. So. <laughs> well, I'm Patty Tennyson, and Dorothy was my big sister. Well, not big. She's shorter than you. Yes, you know, you know that. Two people who was shorter than I in any crowd. But she and my other sister, Meredith. We're both big in lots of ways. I always looked up figuratively to Dorothy, or Dot, as we knew her in our family, because she always seemed so smart and knew everything I thought. <laughs> she knew the right thing to say at the right time, and she did. And she seemed to know so many other things. Just was knowledgeable about a lot of things and events. She liked to keep up with things. And you all know that because you know her in many different ways. Of course, growing up, she had an edge on me, years, in terms of years. But it was more than just being older and the big sister. She. She just was very smart, and she set the bar pretty high. I told her that. I don't know if she liked it or not, but, <laughs> <laughs> but she did. So I had a lot to try to live up to. She had an intellectual curiosity. I think you all are pretty aware of that. And she studied and learned about a lot of events. Of course, and we talked about this with some of you today, since I was the baby of the family, uh, as I was growing up, she and my older sister had 
a lot of babysitting duties, I'm sure. Uh, I, don't, I don't really remember that, but I've heard tales about it. <laughs> I don't think she really consented it. I, I really think she enjoyed it. But it was really after she graduated from college uh, and got out on her own that our sister relationship developed. Um, wherever she was working, whether it was in uh, Atlanta or um, Englewood, New Jersey, Jersey. 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 And we were from Milwaukee. So uh, anyway, I visited, visited her in all of those places, and we had a lot of fun. In later years, uh, she and her family would come to California to visit me and my family. And we always had some really great times then. She and my husband uh, had a really great relationship. And they would sit and talk. <laughs> for hours, way beyond my sitting time, but <laughs> they, they had lots of, to, to discuss and, and figure out the world's problems. And, and just, uh, they went from one subject to another to another, you know how that is. After she retired, she would come and stay longer with us. Which and time did she retire that you did this? <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Which, Which time did she retire that oh, you did well, this? Whenever. <laughs> well, last time, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> she would come and stay for longer periods of time, which, of course, we loved. Um, and, and my kids loved her. My grandkids loved her. In fact, there's a picture here with some of my grandchildren <laughs> and uh, Doc. But we would take her on, when, when she could stay longer, we would take her on some of our adventures and take her to Alaska, where one of my kids, my daughter lives, and, or to Hawaii, which she loved, and Arizona. We explored around California a lot. She said, I think I've been to more places in California than Californians. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. Uh, but she really enjoyed all of that, and she'd, she'd say, you know, what did you, people would ask her about what she did when she was with us, and as I say, we, we laughed a lot, and that's what she told them. <coughs> one of the reasons, <laughs> my three kids really loved her, and I think one of the reasons was that she had a knack for finding unique gifts, and she'd always bring something really interesting and fun. And in our household, you'll find a lot of her little treasures that that Doc sent and be on a coffee table or a <coughs> shelf or on a wall or something. And so there are lots of remembrances about that. These recollections you know, maybe very different from those that you have because you knew her in a social or professional life or in her many activities here in Erie in the art scene. And she loved all of that. And all of you were really very important to her. So whenever I visited, it just seemed like everybody that would run into him, she knew. <laughs> I mean, I just figured she knew everybody in here. <laughs> so even though we were separated by years and miles, uh, we had a very close and uh, intuitive relationship. We'd react to things, events, people, songs, um, situations. Uh, in all, very often in the same way, at the same moment, and, and we'd say the same thing to each other. <laughs> um, anyway, th that's kind of fun for me to remember some of those situations. I'm so glad that 
part of her family, Eric and Keith, uh, are now situated on the West Coast because uh, that means we've got a closer tie ge geographically, and I know that we'll stay in close touch, and Heidi's such a great communicator that uh, we'll always stay close. Thank you all for joining us in celebrating the very special life of my sister Dorothy. I thought I could get through this, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Thank you for coming all the way from California. Oh. My name is Barb Boyko, and I'm Dorothy's newest friend. <laughs> we were short timers together. I was her helper, and it turned into being mm -hmm. a great, great loving friendship between the two of us. When I first met Dorothy and went into her apartment at the Regency, it was so bright and yellow, and there was <laughs> all this art hanging, sitting, standing, in every corner, and I was just mesmerized. And she went into the history of Fred and the Rowan art community and how it all started. And we had like a tour in our apartment, <laughs> like a mini art gallery to me, who had never been exposed to any art really um, in my lifetime. And then, um, then I did the cardinal sin. I said to Dorothy, this is just great because I absolutely have no artistic ability at all. <laughs> and then her eyes just glazed over. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, that is absolutely not true. <laughs> and I said, no, it is true, Dorothy. <laughs> she said, uh, get that thought out of your head right now. That is not true. You have the ability, it's in you, you just haven't experienced it. Thus started the weekly door decorating session. <laughs> well, I had no idea you could decorate with so many little tiny scraps of everything. <laughs> I mean, and these things were in the closet, under the bed, behind the door, next to the fridge. But it was a wonderful experience. Experience. And I mean, I thought, well, maybe I can do this. So with her guidance, I learned about color and form and how to freestyle things and turn it this way. And oh no, that's way too straight. Oh, and almost everything had to be crooked is what I thought. <laughs> that was just my interpretation of how it was. And then we kind of became a little famous at the Regency <laughs> because we would hear people from, Dorothy uh, lived up on the third floor, and we would hear about people from the first and the second floor who would come weekly to see the new door decoration. <laughs> on door, and we even took pictures of them, and then she would make me stand in front of the decoration of the door and take my picture so that we could go over the pictures and appreciate. <laughs> and I do appreciate. I love Dorothy, and I'm here to tell you, I am now an artist. <laughs> Dorothy and Evan, if you have a spot, <laughs> I could be the door decorating person. <laughs> so Dorothy really taught me a lot and gave me more joy than I sure that I gave her. When she moved to Sunrise, I we would go on what we called our tours, and they were our garden room and they were the sun room and they were the art tours because everybody decorated their doors <laughs> at sunrise. Yeah. And so we would take different floors and, and we would talk about every single thing there. She was just an absolute joy. So in closing, I just want all of you to know what I told Dorothy's family. As, because I was with Dorothy 
in the end of her life. And we talked about death and leaving the earth. And she said to me one day, I have a message you have to tell my family when I die. I said, well, I won't charge you extra for that. <laughs> she said, you have to tell them that it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay, she said, because I had a good life. Mm -hmm. I had a great life. So I can tell you for sure the last days of Dorothy's life were wonderful because her family came and they visited and she was surrounded and she glowed. She absolutely glowed. So I thank you for the gift of giving Dorothy to me, of giving me time with her. And I miss her. And I, I will miss her. But you may see my name in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rich Dardina, uh, for any of you who don't know. I met Dorothy and Fred in 1966 at Gannon. October 1966. He was a <laughs> <laughs> we, we started a little coffee house at what was then the Art Center of Geary with Fred's help. Uh, evolved a year later into the Insecure on mm -hmm. West 7th Street, which was a pretty new place actually for a year. And then it was shut down for one reason or another. Reborn is the 1914 tie a few years later. And whatever, that's the end of that story. But uh, becoming a part of the Livingston family as a, as a friend is amazing. It was, you were adopted and baptized in wonderful warmth and culture that you may have never seen before. It does break you out to think of it. Um, so stream of consciousness. Um, dead chicken dinners, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Cookies, my favorite, the Lev Kuchen, bar none. Uh, and we, we did enjoy raiding the, uh, what did we call that little porch in the back? Where they ran porch. tins, <laughs> curing for six weeks or whatever. <laughs> yes. We would sneak into the tins and steal a cookie or two on occasion. Um, at my first uh, martini at uh, Dorothy and Fred's, uh, they taught me what a dinner party was, which I'd never been to, uh, with great conversation, and wonderful sharing, uh, and warmth and encouragement for everybody. They were amazing people, and Dorothy was, in many ways, the heart and soul I miss her. Um, but we were all touched by her. And there's part of her in all of us. Thank you. I'm Susan Schaefer. I'm Del's daughter. <coughs> You know, the one she won't live with. <laughs> um, I, I met Dorothy through my mom. Um, actually, back in the early 70s, I, during one summer uh, off college, I briefly met Keith. Um, but I really never had exposure to the Livingston family because I never lived in Erie except for a summer here and there during college. And now I'm just regretting everything <laughs> I missed. Um, but nine years ago, I was celebrating my 50th birthday, and um, I met Dorothy before that through Mom. And re do remember um, a Halloween party that we all went to, and Dorothy came as a huge pumpkin. <laughs> she was this little wonderful pumpkin with her drink. <laughs> um, but Dorothy, at and I had no idea of Dorothy's age, and she would never speak of it. And I know now that when she came down to Columbus, Ohio to help with my 50th birthday party nine years ago, she was in her later 80s, and she came on the Greyhound bus 
um, to help with my birthday party and um, and to keep my mother sane when I was doing nutty things uh, instead of helping get ready for the party. J just just a wonderful person and often when we would uh, visit, mom did uh, the grandmother and the nutcracker for many, many years and uh, when we would come in in December for that event, uh, Dorothy would often be the hostess and we would see all mom's friends while we were here in December and Dorothy, you know, would put out her tea set and the home was just so lovely and um, as Barb said, the, you know, all the art, the vibrancy, the color, uh, just the world was in the home. And I know it was very difficult for her to leave that home, but uh, you, you, her family, did such a beautiful job of, of you know, bringing what you could of the home into the, her home at the Regency, and then at sunrise, and I know how much that meant to her. Um, but when we were here last December for Mom's final appearance in the Nutcracker, Dorothy was very disappointed because she could not make the performance, and she had come for many years to see that. And uh, so we went to see her a couple of times at sunrise, and uh, she was in her bed, and we were opening Christmas gifts and laughing. And I said, now Dorothy, I know it was disappointing for you that you couldn't see Mom's last performance in the Nutcracker. So, I am going to recreate the, <laughs> the dance of the sugar plum. Um, and I did so, and Dorothy was quite appreciative. And then, with her stellar wit, said, And what are you planning to perform on your visit this spring? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I didn't, I had been rehearsing Aaron Copeland's. <laughs> and I didn't get it to perform it for her, but uh, whenever I hear that music, I will think of Dorothy. And she was, I'm, I'm so glad I'm not, I'm so glad so many of you preceded me in your tears. Um, she inspires me. Still, she inspires me because she loves life, and she gave that gift to all of us to cherish what we have and to be good friends to each other, and she always makes me smile when I think of her, and um, thank you. Susan Livingston. I married the youngest Livingston boy. <laughs> when I think of Dorothy and Fred, two symbols come to mind. The first one is the citroen. The citroen is a symbol of why I decided to marry Keith. <laughs> he had borrowed his car. The, it was the gold 1972 Kia. He had borrowed it one evening when we were driving, I think I was still in college, we were driving to the Cleveland Art Museum on the way back in a snowstorm. The hood of the Citroen blew up against the windshield, totally blocking our view, the wind-blown, snow-swept highway. I thought, oh great. We pull over, keep as calm as a cucumber, he gets out of the car, the hood is crumpled up over the front of the car. How does he get home? He gets out. He bends it back down. He's on top of the car, trying to use his body weight to unfold it back up to the car. I thought, now I know this is a special car. He is going to catch it when he gets home. We get home, somehow, we pull into the driveway. I have not met his parents yet, so I'm thinking, oh boy, what a great way to meet his parents. We pull in the driveway, and the curtains part from the living room. It overlooks the porch. And there's a blonde woman looking out the window. I thought, that must be her. <laughs> we walk up, and I think, my mother, my mother would 
I don't think I would survive what my mother would have done to me if I had done that to her part. <laughs> we walk in, and she was calm. Is everyone okay? I was worried. Where were you? Everything was fine. I thought, what a woman. And then I thought, what a son. <laughs> It turned out, really, it was Dorothy's fault that that happened to the car. She had had a fender bender and had broken the latch on the car. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 but anyway, that was my epiphany moment that the Livingston family was a good family to marry in. <laughs> the other symbol I have of the Livingstons is the Lake Erie and Presque Isle. And I had to write a few words about that. Dorothy loved Presque Isle and loved Lake Erie. If you don't know, her father had done some research in his college graduate years on Presque Isle itself. So it was very symbolic to her anyway. But she always said it was like a compass to her. It was the knowledge that that lake was always there, and it offered guidance and a kind of a strong sense of presence, as it does when you live near a body of water. So it was a really joyous thing then that when she moved to Sunrise in her final year of life, that her window overlooked the most beautiful view of the water and all the boats. And her fading vision still allowed her to see the blue tarps that covered those, those boats that were out there, covered over the winter. And as spring came this year, she would look out there every day, have they taken the blue tarps off the boats yet? Every day. It was her hope to see the boats sail out over the body of water once more. Well, now Dorothy's ship has sailed. And we all mourn her absence in our lives. But I take comfort in reading a little bit of this poem that I'm sure many of you have heard by Henry Van Dyke. I am standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She's an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch until at last she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where sea and sky mingle with each other. Someone says, there she goes. Gone where? Gone from our sight, that is all. She is just as large as she was when she left my side. Her diminished size is in me, not her. And yet at the moment when someone says, there she goes, there are other eyes watching her coming, and their voices take up the glad shout, here she comes, and may it be so. Jenny Culbertson, and I got to know Dorothy from when I worked in the colony plant at House of Flowers. And after listening to everybody today, family and friends, and I got to meet Heidi today, which I've always heard about. I've always heard of the rest of her family, her sons. I met her sister once when you were in town. Mike, I've talked to you on the phone when you would order flowers. And I think if anyone does a daily read of meditation or inspiration, today is it. This is a real shot in the arm for me to hear all these wonderful things about Dorothy. And we always say Dorothy was. Dorothy is. Dorothy is in each one of you here. She is here with us. You each have such a great part of her, and you will always, she will always be with you. I, Dorothy was part of a group of people that I've got to know were a lot of philosophers. They would talk about life. And, and one of them was Don Robbins, who she was good friends with, and they would talk about life. And I'd say, well, what's life about? Well, when Don Robbins passed away, Dorothy and I went up to Spring Hill, and we went to the celebration of life there. And I got up and said something about Don there. And if you knew Don, he was a wonderful man. He, he was just like Dorothy. They, they were treasures. He, always reciting poetry, had something witty to say. <laughs> you know. They, they just loved life, and they loved to make the most out of it, to have the most fun with it, the adventure. And to me, what life is about, it's about people. It's about people helping each other, people knowing each other, what we can draw that is good from each other. And Dorothy did that, as I've heard from so many people today, to, to become an artist, to help us to become better people, to have a different outlook of life when we're feeling down. 
She was her own person. She didn't care what anybody else thought, as you know. She didn't care if anyone else thought of her car with these ribbons hanging from the back of it. You know, she would come and she, she would change the colors with the season. You know, Jenny, you know, what color are we going to do today? You know, oh, I don't want to do this color. Let's do that color. Now let's do a little bright. Let's put a little wreath on the grill of my car. <laughs> she was always very fussy about it. You know, when the frogs were big in town and we were talking about door, door decorations and we did the leaf frog thing, I did these um, cardboard frogs that we had in the window of the shop to get into the spirit of things. Well, when it was all said and done, she had to have one of those frogs for her door. And she didn't care what anyone else said. She would come into the store and we would go on ideas of what she wanted to do with her door. And yes, it was different. You know, you, you would think the regular norm thing, but she was always thinking of out of the box on what to do with this door. And then she had her little shoe on the floor that she would put candy in. And, and, and people would love, she'd love to make sure that there was candy in that shoe. I've heard about the rum balls. Because one day it was Christmas time and one of my co-workers came in and he brought in some samples of some rum balls that he made. And she approved. And then she told the public stories of how she would make the rum balls, you know, and it was something like, you would roll one and eat one, roll one and eat one. And that was the young ones that were doing that. So, what, what a wonderful woman she was. I, I treasured her greatly. I kept in touch with her after the years, you know. I've seen her go through the phases of life, of having to move out of her house, of having to give up her car, you know, of her losing her eyesight. But she marched on. And when I last saw her some months ago, you know, I would always say, Dorothy, what can I bring back for you when I come to visit you? And she, she remembered, and I didn't know that she remembered. And she'd say, I want you to bring flowers from your garden. Not flowers from any other shop, but she knew that I loved to garden and she wanted flowers from her garden. And I regret not bringing flowers today for her because I just thought, who cares? But it would have been the poppies that are blooming in my garden right now, which are bright orange for her to be able to see. It would be the honeysuckle that now opening up with the fragrance that she could smell. And whatever else I can find that would be different would be the Nadia, you know, the, the treasures that are started from seed. That, and I could tell her about it, and whatever you tell her, she's going to appreciate and enjoy and she would support you. And like I said, she is here. She will always be here. Thank you for sharing Dorothy with me, your family and your friends. I so much enjoy her and I love her. I'm Dave Van Amberg, and I thought uh, you know, Rich and Mike and everybody else talked about so many of the memories from the past. I tell you something that I don't think I've heard yet today, and that is Dorothy's self-appointed role as Mother Hen. <laughs> it didn't matter who you were, how old you were, you could have been her mother's age. Dorothy was non-judgmental, but had the highest of expectations for you. It didn't matter what you wanted to be in life, but you better know what it was that you wanted to be in life. And she was that way from the first time I met her in 1965 until the last time I saw her. Because she did not have an easy life, she lived with an artist. <laughs> not an artist, just an artist, but Fred. <laughs> and she lived through Fred's desires, and successful or unsuccessful attempts at many different careers. Fred was a writer. Fred, as you know, was a sculptor. Fred had his own business. He was an interior decorator. Fred was so many different things to so many people. And whether she approved or not, she supported every step of the way. And she did the same thing for her three children, but she did it for all the rest of us, of her children. And when I started my first business, she said, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I said, are we speaking from uh, past experience or some other observation? She said, oh, a whole lot of past experience, thank you. She said, you want to go get a good job and work for GE for your life? I said, I tried, what? 
tried that. I was with Lord, but uh, this is really what I want to do. And she said, okay, well then let's talk about it. And that's how she would treat each and every one of us. But if you walked in and said, I don't know what I want to do, that's when you were in trouble. That was the <laughs> only time you were in trouble with Dorothy. Because you didn't have your dream, you didn't have your vision, and you weren't going anywhere. And she had no time for people who weren't going anywhere. It didn't matter where your path was. It didn't matter where the end of your vision led you. But she expected you to do it and to do it to the absolute utmost that you possibly could. Well, I'm Keith Livingston. I'm Dorothy's youngest son. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today to share your thoughts and feelings and emotions about my dear father. She was a very special lady to each and every one in this room. Uh, obviously, I knew her as mom, but I knew and know almost everybody in this room because of all the activities that took place at 656, and Cannon College, the coffee house, a multitude of porch picnics. So she loved to entertain. She was a high touch, high caliber person. And one of the things you, we sometimes forget, she was you know, obviously a mom, but she was very much a sister. She was a daughter first, that's where you start out. So as a daughter, she had two wonderful parents in Milwaukee. It must have been a cold winter in 1914. But it, was, it always sounded cold the way she made it sound. <laughs> you walked to school uphill, and you walked home uphill. <laughs> so, you know, and, and maybe that was... Two and out, a half miles. Two and a half miles. <laughs> miles. With no boots. And, and, yeah, they didn't need coats back then because they were tough, pioneer women. <laughs> Miller sisters. But, uh, you know, we have... We have and grew up knowing about Aunt Meredith and Aunt Patty and having wonderful times at uh, the beach in Tarandi and uh, all on of these the shores water, of Lake Michigan. On the shores of Lake Michigan, Muscat, and swimming in some of the coldest water you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Those were summer vacations, fighting poison ivy, and, uh, mosquitoes and flies. Yeah, a few mosquitoes and flies. But yeah, you know, le le just learning how to be family, that's what it was. We'd go to the beach learn how to be family, and extended family. And all of that came home with Rich, Claire, Bill, Mike, David. Yeah. And there were others that came to the house and stayed. Some tried to write books, and some tried to become artists. And my father welcomed them all. And there was guidance, and sharp guidance from Dorothy sometimes, and so forth, and frustration about who was being pushed out of their bedroom to accommodate somebody else. <laughs> uh, all of those things were like, oh, that was mine. Uh, where'd that go? <laughs> it, was, it was a very dynamic and refreshing household and a very welcoming place. Uh, many dinner parties. I can remember when my parents took my sister out to uh, college one time in 68 or so. And they decided, well, we're going to take an extended uh, vacation. They'd never done that together many years with kids. So they went out and saw the Mordocks, and you remember Jeff and Edda Mordock who were in Erie for a while, they spent time in New Mexico. Well, they left the house in charge of Rich. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rich is uh, probably just about four or five, six years older than Eric and me, and Heidi's gone, and there we are. We're holding dinner parties. <laughs> Gary Grot is over there cooking with us. We're having a great time. I don't know that we did a lick of homework for the entire month, first month of school, but we had a great time. That, but to have that kind of trust in one another, to share that warmth with one another, is really what extended my parents beyond a lot of things. But you know, she is many things to us as a grandmother, you know, mother, all of those things. But one of the things that we don't always remember or recognize is the fact that she was, and you read her rich obituary, some of you, maybe all of you, she was the chief of occupational therapy. Not just one place would start out. She was close to being first in the career field, if you ask her. There were probably, you had to have professors, so somebody had to invent what she was doing. <laughs> but 
yeah, she, 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 she claims to have been close to number one, but I don't know how that really works out. <laughs> but uh, she graduates from college in, 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 in 1936 and ends up in Madison, Wisconsin. And somehow the uh, wagon train spirit takes her all the way over to Englewood, New Jersey in the late 30s. And you come and her sister Patty comes and visits her goes and tours New York with Dorothy and then tours New York on her own in the early 40s. But somehow, somewhere in there, as Chief of Occupational Therapy in Madison and Englewood, New Jersey, she gets a job in Lawson General Hospital beginning of World War II, which is a military hospital. It doesn't sound like, a, when we say Chief, I remember her as Chief at OT at the VA hospital in Erie, and that was Chief. There was one position that doesn't sound too impressive to a kid about this. So, Mom, what do you do? And I, over the years, I really realized and learned from her because I would go visit her, and pick her up after school, and have discussions. And I got after driving the car, picking her up at four o'clock. Well, I thought four o'clock was the end of her day, but really that was sort of the beginning of rounds. <laughs> so I'd get to go on rounds with her. She, she would make you say, "Stand in the corner, and we'll talk to this person." There's tubes coming out of this poor guy from just about everywhere, and she would very patiently hold his hand, talk to him, and find out what he needed. Can I do anything for you? Can I get you an activity? Well, an occupational therapist specializes in activities of daily living. Well, I didn't recognize it was also nurturing a soul, but uh, she was very conscientious, and I got to go around rounds. I got to go a lot of them. I also got to learn how to lose the checkers to people from World War One, <laughs> World War II, the Korean War. I mean, these guys were good. I got schooled in a game I really wasn't good at. And I'm thinking, well, they must have gone to a battle and played checkers in the field because they were damn good at checkers. <laughs> but uh, I did all of that. But once, once in a while, we get to talk about what she did in the military. Now, even though she wasn't in the military, I'm very sorry. My daughter, oldest daughter, she's not here. She's in the military. And Dave is taping this for us so that we can share this memorial service with my oldest daughter, Jordan, and her husband, Travis. But our mother was chief of occupational therapy at this Lawson General Hospital in Atlanta. And Patty said she visited Lawson. Well, you find out quickly that when you talk to my mother about Lawson, it was a very special time. There were it was a 3,000 bed hospital. There were a lot of sad, sorry, hurt people. Some hurt deeply, some not hurt so deeply. But she was chief of occupational therapy. And she had a staff of 80 occupational therapists under her, along with a lot of civilian staff as well as servicemen. 